out on this black So much for them when they do get it. But just continue to remember everyone that's in our prayer list, even our church here, we have that. And don't forget to continue praying for our church at 12 o'clock each day, if you would, please. Call to worship. Let's stand, please. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 1. We'll be uh, reading verses 1 through 3. It says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. You turn in your hymnal to page number six. Remain standing as we sing, How Great Thou Art.
Let's pray. Our Father, as we come before you once again in prayer this morning, we just thank you, and we know that you love us. And our Father, we just thank you for the blessed privilege that we have, which we can earn money and return a portion of that money back to you, Lord, as tithes, gifts, and offering. And our Father, as we, as you give it to us, we pray that we are good stewards for that, and we may uh, uh, do what is your willing to do with that money that's given to us, Lord. And our Father, we pray that you would bless each person that gave, bless the ones who could not give. We just thank you for it in Jesus' name. And also, Lord, as we're praying, we're praying for this service this morning. We pray that everything that's said and done this morning may be for your honor and glory. We pray that if there's one person in here that has never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we pray that today will be that day that they do. Our Father, we pray you will help the pastor as he presents the word of God and have the Holy Spirit speak through him to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated for the scripture. Our scripture today is taken from Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. If you want to follow along, you can open your Bibles to there. We'll be uh, looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning. Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? and he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Hymn number 532. Just a couple updates. We, uh, we talked at uh, council meeting uh, 
just a couple weeks ago about uh, taking CJ off of our list. He's at the top of our list, but uh, no sooner than then did I uh, uh, get out and I was getting ready to remove it from the list that I got an email from uh, Lori Fry and uh, telling us about CJ and, uh, the, and all those kinds of things. We need to continue to pray for CJ. Um, he's a 12-year-old boy now. Um, when he was put on that list, he was, he was uh, younger, much younger. He's been on there for a long time, and, uh, but uh, he is waiting for a heart transplant, and uh, uh, he has some uh, problems going on with, uh, the, with his blood type and all that kind of thing. And so it's not just a, any, any old heart's going to do kind of a thing. And, uh, and so he just recently was uh, getting ready for a heart plant transplant that, was, uh, that had come along and, uh, uh, and he developed an infection which put him down on the bottom of the list again. And uh, so he couldn't get that. Uh, uh, but apparently uh, from the, the email I got that uh, CJ is, is doing okay. He's got a pump on either side of his heart to pump the blood because his heart's not not doing the job, but uh, somehow, um, even with all that uh, that stuff that's going on, he's able to come home and spend a couple days at home and then go go back to the hospital, but he's in desperate need of a heart, and um, it just seems like the, that we just need God to intervene uh, in order for that to happen. Um, continue to pray for Dakota. Um, the doctors a couple weeks ago said they can't do anything else for him. And yet today, um, he's, he's continuing to improve. Um, just had a, a, a wonderful uh, message yesterday that uh, uh, from his mom on the, the Dakota's Army page that, uh, you know, he's continuing to fight and he's continuing to, to make progress. His blood oxygen um, has been in the 80s, and uh, they said they even found one or saw one rise all the way up into the 90s, which is wonderful. And uh, they continue to, uh, to praise God uh, for sustaining that boy's life and uh, giving him the will to live. We just need to continue to pray that uh, he would continue to, uh, to work in and through Dakota and, uh, and use Dakota to amaze the doctors at what God can do, right? And uh, so we need to continue to continue to lift them uh, before, uh, lift the, the, uh, the Dixon family before God in prayer and to continue to sustain them and uh, continue to give them uh, the, the, the incremental uh, increases that they are getting. Um, talk to Doris this week, and Doris is doing well. Um, you know, for the shape she's in, she's, uh, uh, she's doing good. And it, I just had a, a, a wonderful talk with her. And, uh, and she's, uh, uh, it just warmed my heart to know that, um, that so many people are, are looking after darts. And uh, she said, you know, she, she doesn't have to do anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody's, you know, continually knocking on the door and uh, bringing food or, you know, and her son has been um, been so instrumental in uh, taking care of every, her every need and, and all of that. She was just in good spirits when I talked to her. And, uh, but we need to continue to pray for Doris and, um, uh, and what, everything that's going on there with her. Um, Need to continue to pray for Roland. Uh, Dale mentioned that, and uh, uh, along with the, uh, um, the the issues with cancer, Roland's having some um, mental health issues. Just real, really depressed, and uh, we just need to continue to lift uh, Roland and Linda in your prayers as well. Um, I was in to see Barb on uh, on Thursday. And, uh, and just found out this morning uh, that, uh, that Rosie's husband, Barry, was admitted to the hospital as well. He's got pneumonia. And, um, and so he is at the York Hospital in room 6012, 6012. And Barb's in room 6010. So they're next door neighbors. And uh, on the same side of the hall, the, the right hand side of the hall as you're going down. So first is Barb. You can peek your head in there, say hi to Barb. And uh, then the next one down is Barry, so you can go in there and peek in and say hello to Barry as well. Um, but uh, uh, and then 
with Barb. I was in to see her on Thursday, and uh, you might want to check if you're going to call or send a card or, or whatever. Um, she may be moving uh, soon, um, so just need to check check with Lynn or check with uh, um, Janet or, or Linda, and uh, they'll let you know, um, you know, if, if they're, she's still in the hospital or not. But she she'll be moving to what did you say the name of that was? Encompass. Yeah, Encompass uh, uh, Rehab over in West York. Um, and uh, so that's uh, over at West Manchester uh, area. Uh, she'll be moving over there uh, when she eventually gets to move, maybe tomorrow. Uh, I'm not, not sure about that. But they were uh, able to do her surgery on Wednesday. And, um, and they were uh, able to keep the amputation well below the knee, which is a, a real plus and... Uh, and uh, and Duke was there when I went got to, and he just is uh, bubbling over with the story about um, the fact that uh, that uh, you know her amputation is below the knee, and uh, they got this much you know much of her leg down below the knee, and uh, just uh, um, and the doctors were impressed that uh, they actually had spurting blood coming out of uh, you know where they cut, and it wasn't just like a, a seeping kind of a blood. And uh, so they were just, uh, they were thrilled um, with the, uh, the, the possibilities. They've already met with the prosthesis specialist. And uh, so they, you know, I don't know how long, I mean, obviously she has to heal and all of that uh, before all of that, but they're even working on that. And uh, so need to continue to keep Barb in prayers as well. Um, continue to pray for, um, for um, Polly and uh, and uh, she uh, had a good week, and uh, she's doing well. But uh, we need to continue to pray for her, as she deals with uh, health issues and her cancer and and all of that. So we need to continue to uh, to lift her in prayer, uh, and then uh, add. Make sure you add Barry to your prayer list as well. Let's uh, go to the prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to. Uh, to come into your house to worship you. Uh, you. You alone are the only one who is worthy of our worship. And so, Lord, I pray that, uh, that uh, as the sovereign God, Lord, we appeal to you as we bring you this uh, prayer list before you. Well, Lord, we know that you are at work. Um, and as uh, 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 Marty said this morning in Sunday school, you've already been there. You're continuing to work, and uh, you, you just need to open our eyes to see the work that you're doing so that we can get on board and, uh, uh, and be a part and be a part of uh, what you are doing. So, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes in each and every situation. Uh, uh, and even as we talk about these things that are going on in each one, Lord, we can see how you continue to sustain each and every one, how you look after each and every one's needs. And, uh, and Lord, we just uh, can only praise you because you are the one that is in control. And so, Lord, we just uh, pray that you would uh, move in and through each and every situation, that you would, uh, uh, that your will would be done, that you would be glorified through each and every one. And, uh, and Lord, that, uh, that you would allow us to be able to see your hand at work, that we may praise you and glorify you because you are in control. And so, Lord, I am thankful for that and pray, Lord, that you would continue to do that and all the more and continue to open our eyes that we can see your hand. Lord, I pray that you would continue to be with our church. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to, to use us and uh, that you would use us all the more in our community to, to be a beacon of light and hope and love. And uh, pray, Lord, that uh, you would draw others unto us and uh, may we uh, uh, love them and care for them and, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and feed them as, uh, as, as your children. And so, Lord, I pray that you would uh, lead and guide and direct us in that effort. Be with us now here this morning as we uh, continue in our time of worship. I pray that you would uh, meet us here each personally, that you would speak to us through your word and your truth. And uh, then we would hear only your truth and, uh, and all the other stuff would just kind of fall away and uh, uh, that this would be a good time together uh, in your presence. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I will dismiss the boys and girls for junior church.
Um, this morning, I, I just uh, uh, I was I was kind of wor worrying about uh, or wondering what I was going to teach um, this week or what I was going to talk about this week and uh, and next week uh, before we get into uh, not next week. There is no no message next week uh, that we're having the uh, concert, but the week after that, the 28th, uh, before we get into May, and then we look are looking forward to Mother's Day and, uh, uh, you know, and all that, and then I will get back into doing a series. And so, uh, but um, my thought went to, uh, and where this comes from, is that uh, next week we won't have Sunday school, and so you will be missing the Sunday school lesson. And so I decided, to include a message that um, that would cover the Sunday school lesson for next week, and uh, in our Sunday school lesson, we were talking about Jesus' authority and about Him being God and uh, and all of that. That's the theme for our quarter, and so next week is the uh, the uh, in our lesson book, the one that we won't get to is this authority over the uh, Jesus' authority over the Sabbath. And as I was looking at that passage, I realized that, uh, boy, this is uh, longer than I can cover in one message. I'm going to have to do two messages. So uh, this week we're going to have the first part, and then on the 28th we will have the second part, looking at verses 6 through 11 in Luke uh, chapter 6. And, uh, but today we're going to look at verses 1 through 5. Now... I'm by no means a uh, master woodsman. Uh, Daryl back there, he's, uh, he's pretty accomplished at, uh, at, and has some pretty good skills, impressive skills, I would say, in that area. But there's one thing that I do know from experience, and that you, when you're working with wood, you need to work with the grain and not against it, right? And so uh, whether you're cutting, whether you're chiseling, whether you're sanding, um, Doing that is a whole lot easier to do if you do it um, with the grain than if you are doing it against the grain. After all, you think about a guy cutting down a tree, it takes a while, especially if you're doing it with an axe, right? You're cutting, because you're cutting across the grain, and you can only take out a little chunk of wood at a time <coughs> when you do that. And so, uh, and actually what you're doing is you're you're cutting into the wood across the grain, and then you're snapping off those pieces along the grain so you get a chunk of wood out of there because it comes off uh, and is easy to work with the grain than against the grain. But um, a lumberjack, um, that, uh, you know, I know they don't do that too much anymore, uh, but uh, you can go to the state fairs and you can watch the lumberjacks um, actually use an ax and uh, try to cut a tree um, against the grain and it takes a while and it takes a lot of effort and it takes muscle um, and a lot of sweat to be able to do that but if you go against or with the grain now I am uh, I, uh, I remember in my my youth and uh, you can look at me now and know that I don't do this uh, too often anymore but uh, I was in charge of splitting the firewood uh, for dad he would bring home uh, truckload after truckload of, of wood that he had cut up in the uh, up in the mountain. Well, actually, I had a part in that too. But uh, uh, but when it got home, we unpiled it or just piled it up, and it was my job then to split the wood and then stack it up and uh, and uh, so our uh, store of wood. And so uh, uh, I got pretty good with swinging an axe. But you don't you don't uh, especially if you get one that was uh, a knot, you know, or the the beginning of a Y in a tree where the Two pieces, you know, the, the, the green all goes cattywampus, and uh, there's no split in that with an axe, right? You can maybe get a piece off here on the outside or, or whatever to make it a little bit smaller, but you can whack at that all you want with an axe, and it's not going to split. Uh, it's amazing how tough and, uh, and uh, incredibly difficult it is to, uh, to do that. So Jesus came to earth as truly God and truly man into a world that had become so legalistic that the actual laws of God were increasingly misunderstood because of the addition of man's ideas and rules. And Jesus, knowing the difficulty ahead, 
continued to chop against the grain with the acts of truth. He continued fighting against legalism and self-righteousness. Now, the account that we have here today is all about grain. No, it's not about the grain of wood and, uh, uh, or anything like that, but it is about grain nonetheless. And today we're going to see three aspects of Christ's lordship. The first is in verses 1 and 2, Jesus is Lord over the law. Verses 1 and 2 say, On a Sabbath, while he was going through the green fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on a Sabbath? Well, some may read this and take issue with the fact that um, just what the disciples were doing. They were reaching into a, the grain field and, and plucking the heads of grain, um, you know, the, the, the tops of the wheat or the barley and that, that was growing there and, uh, and, and out of some farmer's field that they didn't, uh, that they didn't belong to. Um, and, uh, and so the issue isn't, that isn't the issue that the Pharisees are talking about here. Uh, it, but instead, people today read this and think, well, aren't they stealing grain, right? You know, come on, Pharisees, you're all missing, you're missing the captain obvious issue here. Um, and, uh, but that's not the, what the Pharisees were talking about. And yet the Pharisees realize that the disciples of Jesus um, are in fact not stealing. The Jewish law actually allowed them to partake as they walked through the field of another. In Deuteronomy chapter 23 and 24 and 25 talks about this. And uh, 24 and 25 says, If you go into a neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, as many as you wish. But you do not, but you shall not put any in your bag. And in 25, if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So that was the extent of the law. You could eat off the, your neighbor's plot. And actually, uh, hospitality of this sort was understood in Israel and was even the law in Israel. You know, there wasn't a gas station on every corner or a fast food restaurant to stop by on long journeys like there are today. You know, not a rudders on every corner, you know, where you could stop in and uh, and get your your ginger ale to drink or uh, or whatever, right, honey? And uh, uh, you know, and or stop in, grab a sandwich or a snack uh, to get you on your way, um, you know. But uh, um, but uh, and and you think about the, that everywhere that the Jews of that day went, they were walking, and so without a McDonald's, without a place to stop and get water or drink, or, and all of that. So the Pharisees aren't knocking Jesus on this particular issue. What they mention is that the disciples are plucking grain and eating it on the Sabbath. And they claim that what is occurring is not lawful. The Pharisees are claiming that Jesus' disciples are lawbreakers and that he needs to intervene. But whose law is being broken? They're going out, or they're going to quickly find out the answer to that. You see, the Mosaic law did not forbid what the disciples were doing. It was entirely lawful for them to eat when they were hungry. And it was entirely lawful for them to glean in this field, as long as they didn't use tools in order to do so. The laws that they were breaking were none other than the legalistic additions of the Pharisees. The Pharisees had determined that picking the green was the equivalent of reaping. Rubbing the husks together to separate out the edible portion was equivalent to threshing. And throwing the husks away was equivalent to winnowing. And they had determined that this was nothing short of harvesting, which was against the Mosaic law. And because they exalted their own opinions and regulations over the actual law of God, they were infuriated at what Jesus' disciples were doing by disregarding their rules and regulations. So, you know, you get the picture here. You, you can't help but think about how the Pharisees continue badgering Jesus and, and here his, Jesus and his disciples are out in the field and they can't 
cannot seem to avoid the Pharisees, and they're like little evil detectives following Jesus every move that he makes. And, uh, and we have to t- step back and, and worship Christ at this moment for, uh, for his patience, for not calling down fire to destroy them at this very moment. So to help put uh, into perspective, perspective the legalism of the Pharisees, it's important to note some of their laws. These laws are found in the Talmud and Mishnah. And uh, these are books that were written sometime later than Jesus, about the year 200. They weren't finished till somewhere around 500 AD, uh, well after the time of Jesus. But, um, but the Jews today, this is, what, this is the stuff that they, they follow. And so many of these laws centered around the Sabbath. And so the religious elites had successfully turned the Sabbath from a gift from God, giving rest to the people into the most burdensome and dreadful day of the week. I've included only a small sampling of Sabbath ordinances and rules from Edersheim's book. It's called The The Life and Times of Jesus and the Mishnah. Uh, It's too bad that... uh, that, uh, What's the, the fellow's name? Sherwood, his last name Sherwood? Derek. Too bad that Derek's not here. He is very knowledgeable about, um, about these. He, he's been studying and, and, and those, but uh, he visits with us every once in a while. But, uh, and, but uh, Derek would be able to, to fill us in. But anyway, this book gleans these regulations from the Talmud and Mishnah, which are rabbinic documents that describe ordinances in detail. And here are a few rules that you might that might make you chuckle. Traveling more than three thousand feet from home was forbidden, <coughs> unless you had placed food at the three thousand foot point before the Sabbath, which would consider this spot a home, and then you could travel another three thousand feet from that point, or you could place a rope across a narrow narrow alleyway, and it would be considered a doorway, which would now make this an entrance to one's house, and the 3,000 feet, you could actually start there. So if you put a piece of rope across the alley, every 3,000 feet, you'd be entering into a, another home, and you'd be legal. And so you could be traveling for uh, miles, you know, if you had enough rope and uh, enough foresight or enough food to, to do all of that. But it was illegal for you, um, it was considered work for you to travel more than 3,000 feet on the Sabbath, unless it was in your home or to a home or whatever, and you could get around the law and, and all of that. No fire could be lit or, I thought I found this interesting, put out. What happens if there's a wildfire? Uh, you can't put it out on the Sabbath, that's work. Warm water could be poured into cold water, but you could not pour cold water into warm water. Seems silly, doesn't it? Bathing is forbidden on the Sabbath. We've got some smelly participants on the Sabbath. (laughs) You can only carry enough ink in order to write two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, any more than that, and it would be considered work. How much ink do you think it takes to, to write two letters of the, the, the Hebrew alphabet? I'm thinking that's not very much, you know. Uh, clothes could not, no, this is I thought was kind of interesting. Clothes could not be examined or shaken because you might kill an insect in the process, which would be considered work. And if you toss an object up in one hand, with one hand, you have to catch it by the same hand because if you caught it with the other hand, it was a Sabbath violation. I can't help but see the Pharisees walking around with a whistle, calling violations like an NBA referee. When it gets complex, though, they have to meet together to try to figure out what the actual rule even means. You know, have you ever played a game with, with someone who changed the rules as you went? or who made up the rules and uh, didn't tell you all of them as it went along. <coughs> They're always one step ahead and, uh, or, or two ahead, and there's no way to beat them because they make the rules. 
the new Uno card games. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Uno. Uh, Lamar, you play Uno. Uh, the new Uno card games come out with, with this uh, pack of uh, make-your-own rule cards, right? Or the make-your-own wild cards, right? And so, you know, I, I, and I'm not sure how, you know, what the point is, but you know, we, we, we want people to win, and so you get to make your own rules. And, uh, and so they actually sell those uh, Uno card games, the new ones, with blank make-your-own uh, wild cards and, uh, and all of that, so you can be sure to win. So uh, you go to Walmart and grab yourself a new, uh, new pack of Uno cards, and you'll win all the time. So that was what the Pharisees had done to the Sabbath. They had created so many rules that the Sabbath had become a burden instead of a blessing. What was given as a gift from God to be a time of rest had become a complex web of legalistic rules and laws only known by the religious elites. You see, the Pharisees knew all the tricks to win these games, but the common people didn't. And so most Jews suffered under the burden and weight of the Sabbath regulations, while the Pharisees were able to keep their rules and still move about. But as I've already alluded to, Jesus is Lord over the law. And to illustrate this, he shows us that he is Lord over the loaves in verses 3 and 4. Now, for those who might not be as quick at picking up on the metaphors, the title of the sermon is Going Against the Grain. And we discussed picking grain in our first point, and now we're discussing loaves of bread, also grain. So I just wanted to make sure you're still with me. Now, we're all back on track. Let's read verses 3 and 4 again. It says, And Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with with him, how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those with him. Now, I just want to uh, preface this. This is is really the crux of what Jesus is saying, Um, the whole thing here and it gets very complicated real quick and uh, so try to stick stick with me and if you have questions you can ask or or whatever later but uh, um, but this is the point that Jesus is making now to understand Jesus reference regarding the bread of the presence we need to go all the way back to Exodus chapter 25 verses 23 and 30 and Leviticus 24 verses 5 through 9 those two scriptures mention the 12 loaves that are pra- placed in two rows of six each uh, on this golden table that was uh, uh, maybe two feet long and I think it was uh, um, 12 and a half inches wide, sat nine inches up off the floor. And you stack these six loaves, uh, two rows of six loaves on, the, um, on that table, the, the, uh, the table of showbread. Uh, that you place there. Now, each loaf, um, each loaf was made with two tenths of an ephah of flour, which functioned as a grain offering, and then that offering was sprinkled with frankincense, which is a very special fragrance commanded by God for this offering. Uh, and just uh, make note, uh, you know, that uh, uh, that frankincense was one of the uh, uh, the gifts that was brought by the Magi to Jesus when he was born. Not that that plays any part in here, but it was all part of this worshiping God and uh, making, you know, that frankincense was used in the worship of God, right? Um, What the Magi were saying, you know, did they recognize Jesus as God? I'm not sure, uh, but God used all that, you know, so that, you know, uh, all of that plays, uh, plays a part in all of this, but we won't go there. These loaves were replaced by Aaron, the high priest, weekly, and they were placed in the sanctuary just in front of the Holy of Holies. And the bread would be removed and eaten within the confines of the sanctuary. So you couldn't go outside the, uh, the church in order to eat this bread. And uh, only the priests were able to consume that bread. And only after um, they took that bread off and put the fresh loaves on, right? So that was the... the, the the story there. So the passage in Leviticus chapter 24 clearly lays out that the bread of presence was to be prepared and eaten by the priests alone. These loaves symbolized the covenantal presence of God with Israel. 
It showed that God was their sustenance and that they were entirely dependent on him. Now, that we understand what the bread of the present was, we can look at the account regarding David and his bread. And uh, for that, we need to go to 1 Samuel chapter 21. And uh, the, the story is in verses 1 through 6. We'll look at that briefly. And David has just been warned by Jonathan of Saul's plan to kill David. David and his men are fleeing Saul, and they arrive at the town of Nob. I guess that's how you say that, N-O-B. The men are very hungry. And, uh, and so uh, there's more to this, and uh, I'll just touch briefly, but they were so hungry um, that you, you get the, the idea that, that, that men were unable to stand. They were unable to function. They were maybe fainting and all of that um, because of starvation. They were at a point of life and death. And, uh, and so David went into the sanctuary and asked the priest for bread. And so we have the account here in 1 Samuel 21, verse 3 says, Now then, oh, and 3 and 4, I'm going to read. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. And the priest answered, David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. So the only bread available here is the bread of the presence, right? The, the bread that's on the, the holy altar there that, um, that was the presence uh, uh, bread that represented uh, God's presence among the, the people of Israel. And we discussed that above. And, so, uh, and that bread was only to be eaten in the sanctuary and it was only to be eaten by the priests. Yet see what happens. In verse 6 of this, uh, this scripture here in uh, 1 Samuel 21, it says, So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord uh, to be replaced by hot bread on the day it is taken away. Now for those of, who, uh, those of us who are rule followers, this account just got very uncomfortable, didn't it? Weren't the priest of Nob sinning by giving David and his men the bread of the presence? And uh, wasn't this a, a terrible thing to do? This is a difficult passage to understand and follow. And Jesus is the one bringing it up to the ultimate rule followers, the Pharisees, in our story today. Although it wasn't listed that David and his men could eat of this bread, God did approve of it. God certainly does desire complete obedience, though. So how can we understand what happened in light of God's commands? Well, Matthew gives us another detail in understanding Christ's teaching here. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 7, Jesus says, and, if, and he was speaking to the Pharisees, and he says, And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. Now here Jesus is closing from Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, and Christ reminds the Pharisees of God's command for mercy. Yes, we are to obey. We are to show God that we love him through our obedience. Right? John 14, 15 um, tells us that in, in no uncertain terms, that if we love God, we will obey him. But we're not being obedient to God by ignoring a fellow human's need and refraining from mercy. We're obeying God by showing mercy like God shows mercy to us. God does not call us to cold-hearted and calloused observance of rituals and ceremony. He calls us to love our neighbor as oneself. I'll give you a different spin on this to help us see mercy at work in our own lives. We, you and I, aren't supposed to be able to go to heaven because we've sinned. We aren't supposed to be able to come into God's presence because we are sinful. We are not holy. But because of the great mercy of Jesus Christ who intercedes on our behalf and who paid the penalty for our sin on our behalf, we can do both of these things through faith, repentance, and trust in Jesus Christ. And so because of mercy, because of God's mercy, we got around the, 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 the rules, right? You know, uh, we, 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 don't, uh, we won't die because of, because of our sin. Now, don't hear this passage that Christ is saying that God's commands are not important. That 
is not the point that he's making here as we mentioned what he taught about the connection between loving God and obeying God in John 14, 15 and above. I want to summarize again, and uh, to do that, I'm going to read a quote from uh, the Pillar New Testament commentary, uh, which is edited by D.A. Carson. And I tell you that because, um, just because of that, it is my favorite set of uh, commentaries, and I will use that one first and foremost, and then I'll add to it from, from all of that. But this particular volume on Luke is written by James Edwards, and he writes um, here, Jesus cites David's violation of Torah not as an excuse for his action, but as a precedent for it. In alluding to David, Jesus invites a comparison between his person and Israel's royal messianic prototype. Um, this is the first of several references or allusions to David in Luke that help define what kind of son of God Jesus really is. A blind man in Jericho will call Jesus a son of David. Uh, we talked about that on, uh, on Palm Sunday. Later in the temple at the heart of Israel, Jesus will pursue the issue of Messiah by questioning the religious leaders how it is possible for Messiah to be both David's son and David's Lord. And that's in uh, uh, chapter 20, verse uh, 41 and 44. Jews, they considered the Messiah, um, since he's a descendant of David, to be the son of David. But Jesus asserts the higher authority of Messiah, who is the Lord of David. In appealing to David here, Jesus begins to define his authority as the royal son of God, anticipated since the reign of David. Now, I, I don't, you know, maybe that muddies the water, waters for you and you don't catch all of that. But what, G, what the, 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 the author of this, um, this um, commentary here is saying is that Jesus, in citing this story, was declaring that he's the one that made the Sabbath. He's the Lord over the Sabbath. He's the one that didn't condemn David for what he did um, because he had mercy on David and his companions and they were doing God's work and they consumed the bread, right? And so God is the one that gets to make the rules, right? And so David was allowed to eat and violate a part of the actual ceremonial law, how much more can Jesus Christ and his disciples eat in a lawful way then on the Sabbath? Jesus is Lord over the law and Lord of the lo loaves. And finally, we see that Jesus is Lord over the last day, verse 5. And verse 5 says, and he said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And so I'll start uh, here in this discussion with looking at the last word of this verse, which is Sabbath. The Sabbath began or was given to Israel as the last day of the week or Saturday. This was given in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11, which says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and you shall do all your work. But the seventh day it is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Further understanding of the Sabbath even refers back further to creation, as we see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, which says, And on the seventh day God finished his work, that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. The Sabbath was a very special day given to Israel. And Jesus claims here in verse five that this day is his to rule over. And in doing so, we see Jesus use a name that we have only seen one other time in the book of Luke so far. That was in John or Luke chapter 5, 24. Uh, but a name that will continue to come up more and more, namely, it is the Son of Man. Um, now, we, we, we get into this, we're just studying Luke in the middle of, you know, all the other things that we're kind of studying. But it, had we been going through the book of Luke uh, from the beginning all the way up to chapter 6, the mention of Jesus as being the Son of Man would have only come up one time. 
right? This is something new that is uh, happening here, but it will become more and more frequent as, it, as uh, Jesus' ministry goes on and, and all of that. So we need to keep that in context here, right? This, this idea. And so as we mentioned, as we went through chapter five, or uh, if, if you look through chapter five, the term is, is referring to a messianic term that came from Daniel chapter seven, verses uh, 13 through 14. And uh, it's a vision that Daniel has back then. And uh, uh, God is sitting on the throne. And then there comes one looking like the son of man who comes and sits on the other throne. And uh, judgment then begins, you know, so Jesus takes the throne and then begins his judgment, uh, speaking about the end, end times. So, but it's a clear picture, at least in the Jew's mind, maybe not so much for us as we try to struggle with all of that, but it was a clear picture of uh, that one who was coming, the Son of Man, was the Messiah, right? So the Son of Man is Jesus, third most popular title in the New Testament. It's actually uh, number one when you consider the names that actually come out of his own lips as he refers to himself. That title is given some 82 times in the gospel, and all but three of those times are directly from the mouth of Jesus. Now, the most common title of Jesus is Christ in the New Testament, which means anointed one, and is the direct Greek translation of the Hebrew title Messiah. This title occurs some 533 times in the New Testament. And the second most common title is Lord, which is the direct parallel of the Hebrew word Adonai, um, which means Lord or referring to God as their master. This particular reference is used in this verse as well. And so I think it's important for us to, to, to understand all of that, what you know, Jesus is actually saying here when he talks and uh, is speaking. We mentioned that the Sabbath found its origin in creation uh, you know, just a couple minutes ago. Yet Jesus referred to himself as Lord over the Sabbath. Do we understand the magnitude of what Jesus just said? He just said that he is God and created the Sabbath. In essence, he looks at these religious leaders who dared to try to make their own rules and regulations and, uh, you know, and incredulously, you know, said to Jesus, who do you think you are by allowing your disciples to do this? But Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. You know, we celebrate Sabbath on Sunday because, you know, it's the first day of the week when Christ was raised from the grave. So early, the early church started meeting on the Lord's Day because he's Lord of the Sabbath. He was Lord over this day. He could not stay in the grave. And, uh, and what better uh, uh, illustration could we have that, that Jesus was God than on the Lord's Day? And so we began celebrating Sunday as uh, as our sabbath and because this day is so important to christ we should hold it in high regard as well uh, this took me on a tangent as i was uh, thinking about all of this and so there was a conviction here and uh, i'm going to share that with you and uh, and many of you this does not pertain but to us in as a whole it does now i've always held high view of church attendance now Growing up, maybe some of you have heard this story, but growing up, my parents did not go to church. Um, I probably could count the number of times that my mom and dad went to church with us and, uh, and did not. But my dad, every Sunday, would get up and uh, he would drive my brother and I. Now, I have, uh, there are four of us kids, but uh, the other two, uh, Tammy and David, were much younger than, than we were. So... Uh, my brother Rick and I, um, dad would drive us every Sunday and drop us off at church. And I thought that was kind of odd. Uh, we lived uh, about five miles from town, and uh, he would drive us into the town of Dauphin, into this particular church. And as far as I knew, they didn't really know anybody there, or, I, you know, they must have known somebody or had some. But dad would drop us off. We would get out, and uh, we were, you would not do this anymore. <laughs> If you were, uh, but you know, I was six, you know, maybe my brother was four 
and uh, and the two he drop drop us off all, on the sidewalk, and we we go in, we find Sunday school, and and uh, every Sunday he would take us, and then he'd go he'd go drink coffee and uh, read the newspaper in the local restaurant, and when Sunday school and church was over, uh, he was there to pick us back up, take us back home, and uh, again to do it next next week. But uh, I, I and I don't know why, but every week I went to church every week. My dad made sure that we went. We never missed. Um, rain, snow, doesn't matter. Um, we, we went every single week and uh, we just did not miss. Even during Hurricane Agnes, um, you know, the, we were stuck in our valley and uh, uh, because of the flood. But there was a church just down the road. Now, it wasn't the church that we normally went to, um, but we went to that church every Sunday, you know, till the rain subsided and the, the flood waters went down. And then we went back to the, the other church and, uh, and all of that. And so uh, dad made sure that we got to church. But, and somehow that stuck. My, Beth and I, we have been uh, faithful church attenders and we make sure that our children go to church and uh, that they're uh, raised that way and, uh, and all of that is stuck. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, and so... Uh, I, I and I we believe and we know like the the verse in Hebrews ten twenty five which says um, that we need not that we cannot neglect meeting together and uh, stresses the importance of believers regularly attending worship together and encouraging one another and uh, and all of that. But the true conviction that I received from God was my view, which elevates the need for church attendance because I missed the bigger picture. But this last week, God revealed to me the main reason why we must attend church regularly. It's not because of how much we need church, although we most certainly do need to regularly be in church for our spiritual growth. And the points that I listed a moment ago are definitely correct points. Jesus Christ loves his bride, namely the church. And he desires us to faithfully attend church because he desires our cor corporate worship of him. This is, we attend church here not so much for us, but it's all about God, to worship him, right? That's the point. We come to worship Jesus Christ because we believe that he is sovereign God, that he is the Lord, right? That he is um, the Christ and he is the Messiah. That's got to be our number one. Right? If we come here to satisfy our needs, we come here to satisfy our desire to, to you know, we're, we're, we miss the point. And too often it's easy for us to do that. It's easy for me as your pastor. You know, I, I look around and I see all the empty spaces, you know, and I think, oh, you know, maybe I'm not doing such a good job anymore and, uh, or, or whatever, uh, you know, and uh, all of that kind of thing. But that's not... The, the point, the point is that we come to church because we worship God. Now, you all are my brothers and sisters. We are all in this together. And you may be able to look at me and let me know that you're fine with not coming to church regularly. You might be able to let me know that you listen to podcast preachers, which are frankly better than me. Thank you for not telling me that to my face. Uh, I appreciate your grace and your mercy in that. You may listen to worship that is better quality than what we sing on Sunday morning. And you may be able to tell me that you do church on, or do church on your way to work in, in the morning in your car. But Jesus demands and deserves our regular corporate worship. You need to be at church because Jesus deserves to hear your voice join with others. You need to be at church on Sunday because Jesus deserves your faithfulness to his bride. And despite how messed up and sinful the bride, namely the church, can, can be, he desires and requires us to be an active part of his church. It isn't about me being pleased or happy or even you being happy. It isn't about a certain amount of people sitting in the seats in this room but it's about Christ being honored and glorified as worthy of all praise. Because he is the Lord of the Sabbath, let us honor him as such. Now I know this message ended a little more difficult than it began, but we need to honor Christ as Lord. He is Lord over everything, especially our Sundays. 
And I pray that we make every effort to regularly attend services, not because we should, not because of what we get out of it, not because of the approval for man, of man, but for the glory of Jesus Christ. He is worthy, and he is the only one that is worthy of our worship. If you don't see him as worthy of your obedience and regularly gathering for corporate worship, I pray that you test your heart. Is he the Lord over all your life? I understand that there are times when, when someone might miss, and I'm trying to play, not trying to place a legalistic burden on you. Um, that's what we're talking about uh, here against, right? Uh, but it's all about Jesus. It's all about him being God, who he claimed to be. He is Lord, and he deserves our worship. True salvation requires true submission. We must not only believe the right stuff, um, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who lived a sinless life and died on the cross for our sins, that he rose from the dead three days later and now is at the right hand of God the Father. Believing correctly is def definitely the foundation, but true salvation requires true repentance, turning away from our sin, and true submission, acknowledging Christ as the Lord over each and our, our, our each one of our own lives. If you haven't done that and you aren't sure, I would love to chat with you and uh, the altar is always open and uh, you are welcome to come and someone will come and pray with you and uh, we can talk about that. Obviously, we won't be perfect on this side of eternity, but if we're truly saved, God will continually continue to sanctify us by his Holy Spirit. We will continue to, he will continue to discipline us as his children that he loves and help us follow him faithfully. He's already done all the work for your salvation. You just have to believe, repent, and submit. And he will continue doing all the work in your life uh, if you will step aside. Jesus Christ is worthy of our praise and honor. He's worthy of our submission. He's worthy of giving him, uh, of us giving him our entire lives. Jesus Christ is Lord over the law. Lord over the lows, and yes, he's Lord over the last day, the Sabbath, and above all, Jesus Christ is Lord, period. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, forgive us for being Pharisees, those who come to the Bible expecting it to fortify and fulfill our own ideas, rather than a seeker of truth who approaches the scripture to hear you speak to us, your ideas. Um, who we should become and what it is that we should do in response to them. Create within each of us a need to have the scripture fulfill us rather than exalt us. May we glorify you in our thoughts, our speech, and our actions, and we may, you, or may we honor you through our corporate worship in the only name given to men by which you might be saved, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you... Uh, Find in your hymnals hymn number 552 and stand with me as we sing, My Jesus, I Love Thee.
Now to him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.